Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God. The fifth trumpet, when the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, and the key to the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit and smoke went out of the pit like a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have. Hang on. Power? You guys got to help me here. Power. Thank you. Now, if you do a study on locusts, which you're not going to, why would you? I'll just tell you. Very weird words will fascinate me, and you don't need to look them up. But these are not bugs. In Proverbs 30, 27, it says, why? Well, to help us here, I think. The locusts have no king. We're about to see that these locusts have a king. I think that this is demonic. I don't think it's bugs. There's another interesting passage in Amos 7, 1. That says, the Lord has shown me, and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming. And behold, one of the young, devastating locusts was Gog the king. Now, we know Gog is in Ezekiel 38, and then he shows up again after the thousand years. So he's some type of spirit of the Antichrist or something. But that's an interesting passage linking locusts with like a demonic spirit. Revelation 9, 4 through 6. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth. These are the locusts or demonic things, whatever these things are. Nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So everyone on the face of the planet except the 144,000 evangelistic Jews. They were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment them for five months. The only other judgment I could find that lasted five months was Noah's flood. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. So they're tormented. They're not allowed to kill them. And the men can't kill themselves. Now, if I strapped a whole bunch of explosive to myself, blew myself up, and jumped off a cliff, I'm still not going to die. It's a very interesting statement, which I think a few of us, Arlene, have studied. How is that possible? How can you not kill yourself? It's interesting and horrible. What we're seeing here is like, oh my gosh, that's not God. My God's a loving God. What are you talking about? But ultimately, the judgments of God are the mercies of God. He's giving men every single chance on the planet, affecting every part of their life so that they will cry out to him and be saved. Revelation 9, 7 through 9. The appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had their hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. Revelation 9, 10 through 12. They have tails like scorpions and stings, and in their tails is the power to hurt men for five months. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss, and his name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek his name is Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. So here they're stinging, they're hurting men for five months. I'm guessing you can't hide from them. And here it's when it says they have a king over them. And we know that locusts have no king. And interesting that Gog is mentioned in the book of Amos. So it's just one of those things that's creepy, demonic. I mean, imagine when the restrainers were moved, when the Holy Spirit in us, the restrainers were moved out of the earth, what is being unleashed? It's not just trouble, it's things that we would restrain. It's, it's under God's control, but it's insane. Now, Revelation 
9, 13 through 16, the sixth trumpet. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released, so that they would, that they would kill a third of mankind. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. Now this verse is interesting because we have four angels bound at the great river Euphrates. Where's the river Euphrates? All this is happening in the Middle East. Where's the United States in Bible prophecy? Well, we're either the young lions of Tarshish, and we're just mentioned in one verse, but we are not mentioned. It doesn't mean we're not affected by these things. I think we are minimized. But this is the great river Euphrates, which flows through Syria, Iraq, to join the Tigris, and empties into the Persian Gulf. Now, who's heard stories about what this 200 million might mean. What are all the, because we're just, it's conjecture. Some have said it's the Chinese because they can have an army of 200 million. What do you think? India. India can have a 200 million man army? Really? Are they getting busy back behind the scenes and we don't know they're getting ready to do something? Anything else? Muslims? There's 200 million Muslims. Has anyone ever heard about, yeah, possibly. Some believe that in Psalm 83, there'll be, many of them will be taken out, if that's a prophetic psalm. 200 million, what if they are demonic beings, like this locust? Like imagine, since we, it doesn't say, he's saying armies, He's just saying rows and rows, and you know, you're just trying to put a word on this. So I don't know what the 200 million are, but imagine something like that being let loose. He heard the number of them. Anytime there's something specific, you want to look at it. But Bible prophecy students usually leave with more questions than they do answers. In Revelation 9, 17 through 19, and this is how I saw in the vision of the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth, is that how you say that? And of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceeded fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Now from Debbie's Revelation class, does anybody want to comment on this passage? Yeah, it's all sounding pretty dark and demonic. I agree with you. Well, and it could be that, you know, we're only given this much and you have John looking at things that are supernatural, things in heaven, things happening in the future. He's trying to describe this, obviously, the help of the Holy Spirit. But there's a lot of detail here. It it's, could be an army, what she was saying, is describing the current military gear and how they wear their masks and their breastplates and how they dress. Um, it could be. It could be people. It could be demons. 
You have heads of lions. I mean, you're just trying to figure out what is John trying to tell us he saw. Um, out of their mouth proceeded fire and smoke. I think she's saying that could be like military equipment. He's never seen a tank, you know, shoot fire. So he's trying to explain to us what he's seen. These are three plagues. So if you have a third of mankind being killed, we've already had a third being burned up. You kind of have to wonder what's left. But being having the power in their mouths and in their tails, I don't know if that describes anything military, if it's demonic. Having serpents having heads and doing harm. So he's trying to describe that a third of mankind is being killed. So these trumpet judgments are all what we call the judgment of the thirds. You have a third of the earth, a third of mankind, a third of the heavens, the cosmos. One third is a pretty big chunk. Revelation 9, 20 through 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of the immorality, nor of their thefts. So here we have the seven-year tribulation, and these judgments are literally in the first half. The point is that all these things are happening and they're still not repenting. So the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, well, who does that leave? If there's seven billion on the planet, how many are raptured? Two to 500 million? Probably not as many as we think, unfortunately. Then you have all of them being killed. You have this small amount left. So they've seen all these things up to this point, and they still do not repent. They know where the wrath is coming from. They know this is the judgment of God. They've seen the judgment of the earth. The fact that this can happen and they still don't repent, all these things coming on the earth are just bringing out what was always in their heart to begin with. If their hearts were hardened, they hardened them more. They're cursing God. They're not repenting. He's using external, I think, circumstances to bring out what was already in their hearts. Does anybody have any comments on this verse? I think it's amazing that they're not repenting after seeing all of this judgment being poured down. It's just crazy. We're not going to get into the bold judgments, but if you go back to this here, showing that the church age, once it's over and you have this seven-year tribulation, if the purpose is to turn the Jews to himself, to say, you are Messiah. And Daniel, when he says that he walks in and claims himself to be God halfway through the tribulation, that's when they say, oh, you're not the Messiah. And that's when their eyes are open and they flee to what some say is Petra. So they are, this is the time to open up their eyes so that they can realize who the Messiah is. It's also a judgment for the earth, a judgment for men, a judgment for the heavens. It's a time where Satan and the Antichrist has his time to rule and run things the way that he wants to. But as you read on in the book of Revelation, you'll see in the middle that he's kicked out of heaven and the earth is redeemed and we're all in heaven celebrating. And then all you have left on the earth are what's called earth dwellers and the Jewish remnant. So the 144,000 who are evangelizing are seen on Mount Zion later in Revelation, and they're following the Lamb wherever he goes. They're either protected, it doesn't say if they're in heaven or they stay on Mount Zion, but all you're going to have left in that second half are the earth dwellers and the Jews. And the whole point of Jacob's trouble is to get the Jews to recognize that he's the Messiah, because he can't come and make his second coming until they recognize that he is the Messiah. When he came the first time, he was Messiah, son of Joseph, the suffering servant. So one savior, two natures, two comings, two physical advents to earth where he physically is on the earth, 
a rapture. He just comes in the air. John 14 says that he goes to prepare a place for us. If he does, he will come back and take us to be with himself, that we can be where he is. The rapture is in uh, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, which we looked at last week. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, but he's in the air, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with the dead in Christ who rise first and will meet the Lord in the air, and we will forever be with the Lord. So we're only looking for one thing, and Paul is always telling us to be encouraged about the blessed hope, to look and long for the coming Jesus Christ, not to look for the Antichrist, not how to live during this time. When he's talking to the church in the epistles, he's always talking about the blessed hope and to look for his return, because that's the only thing we're looking for. Once we're removed, then the Antichrist, the man of sin, can be revealed. Then this time of judgment starts. There can be a huge gap between the rapture of the church. It can happen. It's imminent any day. There could be three minutes, three hours, three days, three months, three years, 30 years. Um, we don't know. I don't think it's 30 years. Might be short. You know, when Lot was running up the mountain, just as he's running up, he can almost feel the heat. The fire and the brimstone are coming down. It could be quick. If we're going to look at prophecy being pattern, you can see Lot and the angel said, Lot, you have to be removed before we can send our judgment. So if that is a pattern, then we have to be removed before the seals can be broken, the Antichrist can be revealed. Some have studied the elders, the 24 elders, and you can say they're representative of the church. They're called kings and priests. Um, the lampstands are the seven churches. He's our high priest. He's walking around the lampstands. It was always the job of the high priest to keep them lit and to keep them trimmed and burning. So you can see in the first part of Revelation before chapter 4-1 that where we are, because if you're just trying to find yourself, am I the bride? Where am I? Why all this is happening? I need to know because I don't want to be here for everything she just described because that was some awful stuff. So you want to know that you're born again. John 3.3, 3, you must be born again or you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Everybody has some type of judgment. Ours isn't judgment for sin because he took our wrath, he took our sin. It's judgment for what we did and didn't do. It's going to be for works, so you're going to get rewards or have lack of rewards. So unfortunately, there's going to be regret and tears in heaven. Tears all the way up to here, which really stinks. Memory and tears, maybe so that when we rule and reign with all these new people that are populating the millennium, we can tell them why and how God's word is the best way to live because we have experience, we have memory. Once you get to the new heaven and the new earth, then he will wipe away all tears. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen until then. So we need to keep in mind that this time is closing in. This is around the corner. We have a beam of seat coming. We want him to be proud of us and give him some crowns so we can lay him back down on his feet and not be ashamed at his coming. And then look forward to being the bride, being in heaven for our wedding, coming back to rule and reign with him. So that's where we're at on the lineup. She's, she's asking what happens to the 144,000. Aren't they killed in the middle of the tribulation? That's what she's been taught. The 144,000 evangelized, just like the two witnesses, which we didn't talk about tonight, those are your evangelists. They wouldn't be needed if the church was on the earth. So God sent them. You notice that the 144,000 are somehow missing once you get to the other half. So now there's nobody to preach. So God sends an angel, an everlasting angel, to just preach the gospel all over the world. So where did they go? Um, it doesn't specify. The last time we see them, they're on Mount Zion, and it says they follow the Lamb wherever he goes, and that's the last time we see them. So people have said they're in heaven. People have said, well, you know, last time we see them, they're following the Lamb wherever he goes, and they were on Mount Zion. Well, this is all John describing things that we can't wrap our heads around. So they're either protected, they're on Mount Zion, they're in heaven. It doesn't tell us, but they don't seem to be around. Nobody is. It seems to be a wrap-up. Um, some believe there's two raptures. One of them, we don't, everybody seems to be in heaven when he's opening that scroll saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. There's this huge celebration in heaven 
which makes no sense because you're about to have the bowls poured out. So this is like the worst of the worst is coming and we're having a party. We're understanding that Satan at that point, his realm, that he's been given a 6,000 year lease on, oh, your lease is up. Now he's kicked down to heaven. We're celebrating. He can no longer go before the throne of God. He can't accuse us before the throne of God. He's done. He said, you had 6,000 years to do it your way. Boom. So that's why it says Satan knows his days are short, his time is short. He starts to chase the Jews into Petra because they're all that's left. And God supernaturally protects them. So those that are saved that stay alive and survive somehow get to walk into the millennial kingdom. So every people group, and it's nice to just kind of keep a list. You have the bride, you have the tribulation martyrs, the 144,000, the Jews, earth dwellers, nations, Gentiles, and then she'll go through and talk about all the judgments. Like, well, what's the sheep and goat judgment have to do? Nothing to do with you. That's for the nations. So once the word of God starts to look all confusing, but then you categorize it, you'll get who this people group is, what their reward is, what their judgment seat is. We know we're the bride. Ours is a bema seat. Either lots of rewards or not that many rewards. You know, there is a reward for longing for his return. And we all get that because we're here. So you have at least one crown. But that's just something that's not taught in churches, and we just put our feet up and think, well, I'm going to heaven and I'm saved, and we get lazy. So it's sad. It would be a way to motivate us, but nobody talks about it. But Debbie will be going into the Bema seats and all the judgments. Does that answer your question? I don't see a scripture that says 144,000 are killed. Um, but they are just all of a sudden out of the picture. It's kind of like watching a movie screen where you're watching one scene when you're watching a preview. Then it goes to another scene and then another, and then you can almost feel like you watch the movie as you watch the preview, because you just saw glimpses into each scene, but you know when you go to the movie, you're gonna get more details. So these are almost like flash scenes of what's gonna happen. Arlene? All right, so we have Revelation 14. What was the verse, Arlene? Uh, three, and it's the last part of three. Revelation 14, verse 3. She's talking about the 144,000 to help answer her question. And they, the 144,000, sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. Thank you, Arlene. She says, sounds like a rapture. If you're redeemed, there's so many mini raptures. The two witnesses are raptured. We're not the only rapture. Enoch was raptured. Ecclesiastes 1.9, no, there's nothing new under the sun. So if prophecy is pattern, which is how the Hebrews study it, not Greeks, where we say prediction, fulfillment, prediction, fulfillment, they look at prophecy as pattern. Look for a pattern. If Enoch was removed before the flood, and he's a type of Christian, and the Jews are in, going through, but protected, that's kind of what we're looking for. So study the word in the Greek um, for redeemed, and we'll see what that means, where the 144,000 went. You know what? The earth dwellers, she asked, who are the earth dwellers? Thomas Ice on YouTube has one of the best studies on those two words. And it sounds so simple. It sounds so boring. Once you watch the video, you're going to be fascinated who are the earth dwellers. It's a weird word. It's used over and over again those who dwell on the earth. But it's interesting that everybody gets a title. You know, you've got martyrs, you've got the tribes, you've got the 144,000, the sealed, you've got these earth dwellers. Um, think of the word as planting your feet into the earth and this is your home and you're just in love with yourself and your stuff and your home and the earth and you've just no picture of God in your life at all. He's trying to get their attention with all these plagues and to wake them up to say, look, there's an eternal destiny at stake here. Heaven and hell, they're both real, they're literal. You're going either place. Obviously, you're going to die soon because everybody else is a third, a third, a third, a fourth, a fourth. So get saved. The earth dwellers are, you could say, unsaved Gentiles. But his study on that is very, very good and way better than what I just spilled out. Anybody else? If you don't know who Dr. Thomas Ice is, he's really good. Well, I want to read in Revelation 16... 5 through 7, just to wrap up all the worst that we just saw. Declares of God, 
we are saying this. You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and your prophets, and you have given them the blood to drink as they deserve. Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. This sounds like, what kind of God do you serve? When we get to heaven and we have his mindset, we're his body, and we understand everything in totality, we will agree with him. Right now, it just looks like, you've got to be kidding me. But his judgments are ultimately his mercies. Well, we want to be the bride. And anyone who you know who doesn't know Christ, understanding the rewards and benefits and being kings and priests and ruling and reigning, it's okay, be a tribulation martyr. You got all kinds of benefits. But to be the bride, when you study the bride, she, she, she gets it all. You want to be the bride of Christ. It's just an honor to be able to spend that seven years in heaven learning all these things and getting all this knowledge and get to come back with him as that army. That's awesome. Who wouldn't want that? So the window's closing. Tell everybody you know he's coming soon because he's coming soon. We're at almost at the end of the sixth day, the 6,000th year, and this seventh, 70th week of Daniel, seven years, is you can almost feel the horsemen coming and hear their hooves. It's close, closer than we think. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much that you have allowed us to be alive at this time to be the bride during the church age, the age of grace, where your gift of salvation is a gift and all we have to do is take it. Father, we're so thankful that you have given us revelation of your word, the story of your redemption, the future and details of what's to come so that we can warn others, leave some things behind, do what we can do to understand the days are short and get the gospel out to the lost, that more people would be the bride of Christ, that more would join the army that gets to come back with you and rule and reign. That's just such a crazy honor and privilege that we can't wrap our heads around, Lord. We just thank you for tonight. We thank you for opening our eyes and showing us what your word has to say about the future and that it's detailed and laid out and it will come to pass exactly as you have said. Thank you so much for everyone here. We give you all the praise and glory and honor in the name of Yeshua, our Savior and coming King. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank. Living Word Ministries is a listener-supported program. To contact Debbie Blank, you may do so at livingwordministry.org. That's www.livingwordministry.org. Please tune in each week at the same time for Living Word Ministries with Debbie Blank.